Hello and welcome to my COVID hideout. Uh, here we are in the space that I've spent uh, the last couple of years now. And um, uh, today is a special day. I want to share with the, the community what uh, some of the things that I've learned over the past couple of years on a number of projects around uh, monitoring uh, metrics of ThingWorks for performance. Uh, tuning and just overall health optimizations. So first getting started, you know, let's have a look at um, where this is coming from. And uh, this has really started with this particular article from uh, one of my colleagues, uh, De Sheng Zhu, who has, uh, has put this PTC community post together a number of years ago, going into uh, this T-sample agent application that he built to leverage the ThingWorks REST APIs to essentially uh, scrape metrics off of Telegraph, uh, sorry, off of the ThingWorks REST API, as well as combining with Telegraph plugin to get other metrics off of the different environments in order to provide Grafana dashboards to have a look at um, ThingWorks subsystems performance and health. So I'm sure a lot of you, if you're watching this video, you've seen this, it's been out for a number of years and it's essentially the, the reference. The challenge with this is some things have changed over the years. Uh, one of them is that we now have a metrics endpoint that is a Prometheus compatible metrics endpoint, which did not exist at the time when uh, Desheng wrote this T-sample application. And um, I don't believe that Prometheus was around back then either. So some of the things that have been changed is really we're going in the direction of using Prometheus as opposed to InfluxDB's Prometheus has a time series database as well as an appropriate query language for doing metrics and this type of, type of stuff and can uh, still have the front-end visualization of Grafana. So we're going to take everything basically in this in this community article here, and we're going to get to making some some dashboards. We're not actually going to make the dashboards, but I'm going to show you what we've got. Looking at things like value stream processing, uh, what's completed, what's queued, uh, what's failed, and um, the other thing too that is that has kind of inspired me going towards this direction is definitely getting the uh, aspects of the ThingWorks systems in place has been important but there's another aspect in here that uh, if we just do a search for performance something like monitoring and troubleshooting performance issues if you've not seen it there's some excellent resources in the thingworks online help centers that go over things like memory performance monitoring for memory issues uh, initially there's a lot of talk about PSM and, you know, there's been some changes around PSM and, um, uh, you know, PSM is, is a Dynatrace. We no longer offer PSM because of the fact they're going to the cloud. So this Dynatrace cloud is still available, but, um, you know, a lot of people don't have this at their disposal. And um, so I really wanted to try to use uh, tools that are accessible to everyone that are open source or freely available. And, um, you know, things like garbage collection, troubleshooting is, is quite interesting, but um, obviously requires its kind of point in time. We need to set these things up and we can't really look back historically. And obviously Visual VM and other similar tools are, are great. And this is really what I was driving towards to be able to have such a, um, such a live as well as historical graphical view of uh, things like memory performance. So I'm not going to get into all the things in here, but you know, this kind of gives you an idea of where I wanted to go across a number of fields, looking at database performance, memory, um, thing work subsystem performance as well, and uh, bringing this all together. So uh, for those of you that know me, you also know that I've done a lot of work with Azure. And so over the years, I've, you know, started just by building some of the metrics of uh, the Azure Pass services into, uh, into Azure Metrics dashboards. Like, like I'm showing here. And frankly, this is really great. It's quite easy to do. We can quickly get a visual representation on things like uh, metrics coming off of the IoT Hub, cloud messages, et cetera, et cetera, um, things like VM. 
it um, it gets a little bit more complex though when we want to bring all these different systems together. We were just looking at JVM virtual memory there before uh, on the, the overall heap performance. So you know, getting those types of things in here we can do with things like App Insights, uh, but it you know it starts to get a little bit more complex, and we've really got to kind of pile things together. So enter um, enter what I've done here, and uh, let's just kind of have a quick look at. Um, uh, some of the components. Uh, I should mention that this is going to be a multi-part series where I am going to get into in, in follow-on um, follow sessions, we'll get into things like uh, how I set this all up, essentially going through component by component because there are a fair number of pieces that come together in order to make this uh, possible, uh, as well as bringing it under the Grafana dashboards. So the first thing is is really you know just kind of looking at architecture. What are we talking about here? We've got ThingWorks Foundation backed by InfluxDB for a data persistence provider for the time series, and we got an Azure SQL Server that's providing the relational database uh, model database for ThingWorks. Uh, we've got IoT Hub Connector that's providing our data data ingest um, on a couple of channels today we're really just going to be talking about the mqtt messages that are coming in as well as some azure iot uh, messages and uh, iot how about there i do as i just showed so have some azure metrics as well as log analytics that are wired up to some of the azure services and uh, ideally i want to bring all those together as well under the same umbrella so in order to do this uh, I've placed this monitoring system in the middle, and this is just running on a virtual machine for the time being, um, where I have Prometheus, which is essentially scraping metrics or the metrics collector, as well as time series database that's going to uh, collect, store, and provide um, the metrics back to Grafana. And Grafana that's doing all the dashboarding uh, that's um, either getting those metrics from Prometheus it itself or getting the metrics from here, Azure metrics, uh, for everything that is actually residing already in Azure, as well as InfluxDB, because the InfluxDB internal metrics are actually just stored in an internal database. And um, grabbing them where they're at is, is a lot easier uh, and more usable than it would be to, to funnel them over to uh, Prometheus. So how are we getting the things off of the ThingWorks Foundation? First thing is, uh, metrics endpoint. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen in ThingWorks 9.0 when we brought out uh, Active Active, we added uh, slash ThingWorks slash, slash metrics endpoint, and this is providing us with the um, Prometheus format uh, metrics. I'm not going to show you that today. It's uh, we will I will uh, show you at some point just what a Prometheus format metrics looks like, uh, and then I've got a number of Prometheus exporters that are just other providers of metrics on the system, the node, which is just getting uh, details about the VM, the CPU memory and disk space and the like, and the GMX exporter, which uh, is, is essentially connecting as a Java agent into the Java virtual machine, which is going to get us all the um, relevant metrics from the, um, from the Java virtual machine that's running. And um, access via Grafana Prometheus data source. I can't remember what that means. And uh, over here on the IoT Hub connector, same thing. We're talking about monitoring the VM. We want to make sure the VM and the resources that are provided to the overall Azure IoT Hub connector are sufficient and uh, running OK. So there we're using the node, um, node exporter essentially on all of our VMs, also using the graphite exporter. Uh, if you don't know what graphite is, graphite is the, uh, let's call it old school, very common uh, metrics format that was used as a push-based metrics that uh, the connection server family uses. So all of the connection servers, eMessage connector, connection server, IIT hub connector, uh, are going to have the ability to configure and uh, to push those metrics um, somewhere. To a graphite compatible endpoint yeah it can be a graphite server but in our case it's just a collector for prometheus so that that um that exporter that prometheus graphite uh, exporter is going to receive all those metrics and essentially make them available in a, in a prometheus scrapable uh, format open metrics format and the gmx exporter as well 
as we mentioned about the ThingWorks Foundation, it's the same for the, the connector. We're running a Java application, so we want to get uh, details published up about the, the JVM. Azure IoT Hub, now this is obviously running on Azure, so we don't have any uh, VM, nothing to actually install anywhere. So um, here what, we're, what I'm doing is I'm uh, forwarding and configured the, uh, the IoT Hub to forward the metrics data over to uh, Log Analytics Workbook as well as Azure Metrics so that we'll get the, uh, both of the formats that are collected and stored in Azure. And then I'm connecting Grafana up to there. And uh, InfluxDB, um, as I mentioned, same sort of deal here is, is that this is, um, this is built in to InfluxDB itself where the metrics are stored internally in the time series database of uh, the inner workings of the various systems of Influx. And, uh, and then for the Azure SQL Server, it's the same approach as the IoT Hub. It is a, it is a pass service that's running on Azure. So just leveraging the, uh, the metrics as well as logging facilities in, uh, in Azure to, uh, to get those centralized and essentially bringing everything together over here. So I did want to just kind of throw this up on the screen. A number of ports that are set up here that are, that are open, that are listening on the particular machines here. Um, you know, I did mention that Prometheus, Prometheus format metrics are now what they're going to be called open, open metric standard are scrapable. So they're just exposing a very basic uh, web server on a particular port at, you know, by default, it's at slash metrics. It can be configurable as well. Um, so in order for Prometheus to be able to connect to all these systems and be able to scrape in the, the information, uh, they need to be running you know, have some agent running. This is what these exporters are doing is they're essentially preparing the, uh, the metrics to be scraped by Prometheus. And in this overall architecture, here's, here are the ports that I'm using for the various, uh, various systems. I guess just one other comment is this RMI, Gemx and RMI. Uh, I believe I did another video at some point on um, monitoring the JVM, the running JVM of ThingWorks using um, uh, what's it called? J Console and Visual VM. Uh, if I haven't actually done the video, I guess I will have to because uh, this is kind of uh, has been a step along the way too. Is I use those to um, to essentially figure out which metrics, uh, which MBeans attributes that I wanted to get collected, and uh, in order to configure the uh, the exporter and sort of same process for for Graphite. All right. So yeah, this is just kind of showing that, you know, the direction of some of these metrics, most of them are pushing into Prometheus, but as I mentioned, you know, some of them are, it's actually Grafana that's going out and, and pulling those metrics from those other systems where they may be residing. All right, maybe I should have done that at the end, but we started with that. Let's get into um, what it looks like. And what we can do with this. So I'm just going to kind of start, take a step back here. Um, first thing to mention is I'm artificially running some load simulation on here. So I do have a, um, a simulator that's running four, four gateways, each simulating 100 uh, connected IoT sensors over here. And we've got two of them, two different VMs. And then over here, I've got another another system that is that is essentially doing um, REST API calls, uh, simulating connected users, simulating connected systems that are executing services on ThingWorks, um, and and you know here you can see actually an example of um, Prometheus formatted metrics where we have the definition of a particular metric point, and um, you know, this is actually showing the time buckets that are defined as well as how many of the uh, REST API executions fall within that time bucket. And here we can see this is 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, all the way up to 12 seconds. So uh, it is all running on, a, on the same v, VLAN up in, in Azure. So um, they are quite fast. Um, and I have, um, have about, I believe it's 250, uh, uh, threads that are running this uh, concurrently. 
So this is some simulated load. I've also got um, some other simulated load that we're going to have a look at, which is just Kepware that's got uh, a few configured MQTT devices simulating um, simulating uh, machines. Um, I've used these machines, simulated machines, in other in other videos. They're just sending uh, essentially packaged messages every five seconds, but inside the messages they have. Uh, uh, values from these three points, ramp, uh, random, and sign, every 250 milliseconds. So here we're going to get, you know, less on the number of messages, but more on the uh, number of property updates that are going to uh, kind of hit and impact the system in a, in a different fashion than um, large amount of messages. Uh, I've also put some things in place just to kind of um, make it a little bit harder for the system. I've re returned all of the, the thing works settings to, to default settings uh, for the subsystem configurations, just to kind of, uh, I would say, remove the advantage that I have already done performance tuning on the system as well as um, settings for the subsystems. Um, you know, if you haven't checked out subsystem tuning, then I would definitely recommend it. You know, the, the, the out of the box settings are fine for development and uh, small demo environments, but if you want to put a system into production, you really need to be looking at the settings in here for a number of reasons. And you'll find the subsystem settings uh, se section here in the help file um, where they essentially go over the various various um, sections. Event processing subsystem, WebSocket ex uh, execution, Subsystem, very important, uh, value stream processing and stream processing as well. We'll have a look at those a little bit as we're going into uh, the results. So first of all, I guess we'll start with um, just the nodes, right? Because the nodes are obviously quite uh, straightforward. Uh, we're talking about virtual machines. Uh, this is the, uh, the thing works currently. It's actually running pretty uh, significant load here running at 50% load uh, memory usage we still got a lot of memory free but that's actually because of the fact that I have the um, the heap it's actually quite constrained so I've only given ThingWorks six gigabytes of um, heap space so this is why we have so much left over here I didn't really want to give it too much memory just so that we can see the metrics and the garbage collection taking place nicely. And similarly, you can see I've got a number of different machines up here. Um, this one's my IoT Hub connector, which is really just a tiny, tiny, tiny machine. Uh, it's one core, two gigs RAM, I believe. And um, it might even only be, uh, yeah, I think it's two gigs. Not a whole heck of a lot is happening here. Um, just because it's all, it's really in, you know, it's it's streaming data processing coming through. There's no there's no CPU, mainly it's mostly network. Okay, so moving up the, a step in the stack, we're going from the node up to the Java virtual machine, right on those two virtual machines. This is really important for those components that we're running, right? We are running Java applications. We wanna make sure that the Java virtual machine is running uh, healthy. Um, you can see uh, pretty much the time frame on all these these charts uh, dashboards that I'm showing is defaulted to 30 minutes so these are all quite quite recent um, but here on my um, you know ThingWorks environment you can see that you know as far as the Java application is concerned it's running at 50% and this is actually quite interesting because it's also showing us the, the difference between what the Java application resource utilization is in comparison to the overall system utilization. Because, you know, this is what you typically find if you just look in something like the Azure Monitor because uh, it's very high level metric. And here we're getting down to something that's much more specific to say, I know I'm running a Java VM uh, and I've got ThingWorks, you know, Tomcat is running in there uh, in this case. and uh, the connection server and the other one. So this is giving us a good understanding that about half, we're running at half utilization. As we scroll down, you know, we've got memory performance over here. So we can see how the heap memory is responding 
over time uh, versus the, the, the heap committed versus heap used, as well as the shape and um, form of what's happening before and after garbage collection. Uh, and you can see kind of a couple more, a little bit more concerning patterns here where we're not doing garbage collection for a while um, and the utilization is starting to, to kind of build up here. Um, and, you know, I'm going to back up a little bit here. So lines are just flat here, but if we kind of go back about three hours or so, you'll see that we are starting to see some things creeping up here, like CPU um, load on the system over the past few hours has gone up considerably. And this is because I added those REST API calls. This was taking it up to um, 100 um, requests per second, I believe. And this is taking it up to 250 requests per second. And, um, and that has had an impact on the, the buffer pool slightly. But, you know, specifically when we come down here, we see that it's really had a, an impact on the garbage collection. Uh, and here you can see I just added some annotations in here as comments to say that we added a, 100 threads hitting every two seconds. And then when I, when I took that up to 250 threads every one second, uh, you can see that that's had a, had a pretty significant impact just on the overall frequency that garbage collection is, is taking place as well as the duration. So the duration is still very, very short here, right? So this is something always to monitor is, is you know, frequency as well as time in garbage collection because it's a, it's a core part of the Java virtual machine. The fact that they're happening frequently, the fact that they are short, and the fact that each time that there is one that happens, we're able to recover the memory. This is really a good sign. So although it doesn't look like this kind of normal healthy pattern over here, uh, what we're seeing here, we still do see that although the memory is being used, it is being returned once the garbage collection is occurring. And, and as you can see, I've got the, the hash marks lined up. So you can see that despite the fact that this was a bigger garbage collection to, to be done, it's, it's still, you know, in, in uh, milliseconds uh, that it's taking place. So going down a little bit further, this is kind of a cool thing that um, that we get with the um, exporter, the Prometheus exporter. Gemx Prometheus exporter uh, is the thread states. Uh, so this can be really helpful just in understanding how many threads we have, uh, how those threads are changing over time, but also understanding what the, the state of the threads are. So if I kind of look back a little bit further, um, we do see it's actually over on the other one. Uh, if I change over to the connector here, so we see these these annotations have come through over onto the connector as well. So I can, you know, line up some events from what was happening on the ThingWorks environment over to the connector. And here I can see that this line. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they're they're not all coming through. I don't. They they ought to kind of line up on on all the charts, but they don't. Um, but I, I do see that here we've got a number of block threads. We've got these nine block threads um, that line up perfectly when I disabled a couple of entities on uh, the Thingware side because I noticed that um, they were essentially sending uh, cloud to device messages back to um, back to these devices that were offline, and it was uh, essentially um, you know getting errors back. So. Um, that's quite handy already. Um, we're just at the JVM layer, right? So we're going to move up one more step in the layers, and we're going to come over to Tomcat. Obviously, uh, ThingWorks is a, is a web application running on Tomcat. So Tomcat overall performance and overall health is going to be very important for ensuring that our, our clients that are trying to hit the ThingWorks application can... Um, connect to Tomcat, can execute the application, can make those service calls. And, and what we're seeing here are, are essentially, this is something I, uh, I've made an, a fair number of modifications from, from one of the dashboards I found uh, on the Grafana community. But there's uh, essentially you know, broken down into, into a couple sections here. We have um, uh, two of the protocols, right? There is two connectors on my uh, ThingWorks that are set up, just a HTTP connector as well as an HTTPS connector. The HTTP connector is only for internal communications on the on the VLAN. So it's used to uh, to connect the different things between each other. 
Uh, and I've done that so that I can separate traffic as well as uh, eventually do some kind of deeper network analysis on the, that traffic. And then the HTTPS is for everything that's going outside of the internal network. So here you can see that, um, you know, if I just, doesn't really matter. I've got them repeated. Some number of uh, connectors are going to show here. This is the HTTP connector. And we see the default configurations that are going to come in the in the Tomcat configuration file with, uh, normally these should be the defaults, um, the number of connections that I'm going to accept, um, spare threads, max threads. So, you know, these are all types of configurations that we want to think about um, configuring and tweaking when we're doing performance and load testing, when we're putting a solution into production, because, you know, depending on the number of users that you're going to have, depending on the number of connected devices that you're going to have, uh, other IT systems, concurrency, and the like, you are going to need to make sure that your Tomcat is configured and performing appropriately. I have uh, 250 threads that are presently connected to, to Tomcat here on uh, doing these REST API calls. So you can see these um, these here, they're being, they're, they are being shut down. I think this is why they're being um, diminished. Um, and, you know, we can start to see some of the latency. Processing time is quite slow because I'm, you know, kind of purposely trying to uh, put the ThingWorks platform under duress. Uh, we can also see the network traffic. So the, so as I mentioned, you know, this is different than something like uh, Visual VM or something like this. One of the great things about such a such a monitoring system is that we can look back over time, right? So we can really not only answer, um, be identifying things that are happening in the present time sphere, but also in the past. You know, we can come back in here and we can look at how Tomcat was responding. And you can see really when I started hitting it with the REST calls, uh, because the telemetry, the t telemetry load has been on this for many hours at this point. But you know, here we really have those those REST API calls that are added and that are showing up here in Tomcat. So, um, so yeah, thread utilization, obviously, you know, for concurrency and, and use of the resources in, um, in the virtual machine that you're going to be running, you know, having the appropriate number of threads is going to be super important that you can look at configuring. I don't have a whole lot here, as I mentioned, the HTTP channel is, is used for just internal communications here, so that's why I don't have many here. But uh, you know, here I've got up to a thousand uh, connections on the HTTPS side, as well as you know, max 500 threads, and min spare threads is is 100. So really, the objective there is to make sure that you know we're starting with a significant amount of threads so that we can take uh, a a fast hit without having to spit up additional threads. They're they're just running idle. Um, as we go down a little bit, there's some other things that are interesting on here around the, the top servlets. We can see some of the top servlets that are running and how long they're taking as well as some of the errors that might be coming off of those servlets. Um, you know, this can be helpful really just for seeing response times. You can see the metrics are, can be quite slow when the system starts to be hit, uh, put under considerable load. That metrics endpoint, because we're scraping off of ThingWorks every 15 seconds, uh, there's a lot of requests and there's a lot of metrics that need to be um, pulled together. So that's a good indication uh, as you watch these metrics response times build up. 400 milliseconds is not that bad here, but if it does start to get up to three or four milliseconds, uh, three or four seconds, then it's a good indication that your ThingWorks environment is, is really struggling to get those metrics um, shared up. Okay, so the next part. Um, don't want to say this is the most important part or the most interesting part, but um, you know, as far as really, uh, you know, just observability on what's going on inside ThingWorks, um, what you've got where, there is a large number of subsystems. There's a large number of things that can potentially be executing on ThingWorks, and it can be quite difficult to know what's happening at any one particular time. And specifically, if you do have any bottlenecks, whether they be performance or otherwise. Uh, you know, having a look at having a look at these metrics is is really a good way to do that. So, you know, if I come over here to monitor, just to kind of put into context what we're looking at over there on the other on the other page, um, subsystems. You know, monitor subsystems, 
and then um, event processing. You know, we've got these figures here that show us the configuration, max threads that will be created, uh, tasks that are awaiting execution. So this is essentially what's, what's in the queue, right? We don't have anything in the queue, what's being completed, uh, what the core pool size for handling the event processing subsystem is, and um, total number of tasks submitted. Okay, so we essentially got submitted, completed, and um, max threads existed, current threads in the pool, and currently active threads, right? So if we take the, the difference between submitted and completed, you know, we can kind of have an idea of what's either in process um, or queued, right? Because we have queued over here. So really what we're looking at over here, if you think about these kind of simplistic figures that we can hit refresh on, right? They're a little bit difficult to kind of hold in our minds as far as what the difference here is between these two numbers. So really all we're doing over on the dashboard is we're just looking at these things over time. This is the event process, processor subsystem. And here, if we have a look at this particular uh, dashboard configuration, we're looking at the increase of the event processing subsystem submitted task count, right? So we see the number of tasks over a particular interval period. We're taking those two values and we are subtracting them. Okay, we lost the connection to our Kepware. So, um, this is essentially the, um, the principle that's, that's done across most of these dashboards, right? It's the same metrics that we're seeing here, except the fact as we're pulling them off of the ThingWorks environment, we can uh, post-process them, we can store them, we can do analysis, we can look at them over time, okay? It's the key. Uh, so event processing, we've got the platform subsystem, is another important one. This is going to show us things like memory in uh, memory use, um, thing count, some of these things we've got pulled over here. If we come up to the top, memory in use, similar to the JVM, I just wanted to make sure we had this front and center uh, on this particular ThingWorks page so that we don't have to go to the JVM one. And also noting that this is coming off the metrics endpoint as opposed to coming off the JMX exporter. So it's less detail about the overall JVM memory utilization, but it is, you know, specific to, to ThingWorks. And kind of uh, if we step through some of these subsystems that we have uh, set up here, we've got the WebSocket execution processing. So this is really where um, the WebSocket traffic, you know, which is which is native to ThingWorks for the always on protocol, where things are connected to the platform. Uh, you have those tasks that are coming in, work to be completed, data that's coming in, services that are being executed, what have you, and um, they're being submitted on this side, potentially queued in the middle, right? If we can't execute them, if everybody's busy, all those threads, if the threads that are, that are available are not able to execute them, then they will be queued up here and then completed over here. So essentially on the left, we have... Um, Submission on the right, we have completion. So ideally, we should see a smooth running system. We should see the same kind of uh, equal on what's being submitted and what's being completed. Anything that's different between the two means that there's some some hangups in the middle there, and things are 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 um, something is blocking the overall healthy execution. And I can give you an example of what that what might look like if we kind of go back a few hours. right here, for example. You know, here we had a uh, quite clean event task submission rate that was progressively ramping up as um, something I was bringing more devices online, I believe. And then you can see at this point right here, everything was good over here if we were looking at event queue and thread status in here. And then when I went up to this particular level, this was a little bit too much, right? This is where we started to build up the event queue and thread status and here the event queue is just building up and up and up and up. So this is a good in indication of something that's going to lead you to um, explosion um, because the queue is building up and once the queue becomes full, basically those tasks that are being queued, if they're not able to be executed, they're going to eventually be lost once we reach the, um, the maximum queue size. Um, 
I saw this happening, however, so I essentially remediated the issue, and that was the disabling of those those, uh, those offline devices that were trying to communicate through IoT Hub, and um, that was those those block threads that I showed you earlier. And once I had disabled that device, uh, you can see immediately that um, the queue was able to be executed. Everything kind of got caught up, and and once again, if we look at over here, the completion rate we went from what was very flat. Um, and became very choppy as things were kind of uh, blocked once again to perfectly flat. Okay, so this is a, an, a, an example of obviously I'm load testing, so it's very regular traffic, and we see this regularity in the, in the inside as well as in the outside. So moving down a little bit, this one is um, this one is a section that's unfortunately not on the metrics uh, endpoint. But um, I had to bring in through the um, GMX exporter, and this is uh, what we call the C C3PO metrics, and these are for the database pool that uh, the ThingWorks is using. Um, these are, are, you know, what you'll see in in the help about um, database performance issues, right? If we look at Visual VM to do database performance, it's talking about you know numbers of connections and looking at the the mBeans attributes uh, using using um, Visual VM, and this is really all I've done is I've set up a um, configuration where we're, we're pulling those in using Prometheus to, um, I've lost it, uh, to map those on a graph, and we can see here over time, we'll zoom in a little bit here just to kind of get rid of some of that other stuff, we have the max pool size, uh, which is default configuration to 100, and um, the blue are the currently active ones. And then the bottom is um, busy connections. So you can see the busy connections kind of popping up periodically there and the active connections as well. The, the default um, incremental size is, is five uh, connections at a time. So that's why it's kind of popping up is as those connections are required, it's, it's consuming more. But frankly, there's not really a whole lot of database activity that's going on in any load simulation that I'm doing. So, um, you know, we do see some peaks where the, the active connections are going up, but really nothing, um, nothing major on the database uh, usage. Pending tasks is the same as what we were talking about before. Uh, this is anything that's going to be queued. Uh, okay. Something you want to watch is obviously that uh, we don't have pending tasks building up similar to the other queue, queuing uh, premises. And uh, database helper thread pool by default, this is eight. We don't need to have a whole lot here. Um, depending on the tuning configuration, this is really going to be used to manage these overall database um, connections over here. And, um, you know, eight is already quite significant, but uh, the, you know, if we're running at uh, max threads and pool sizes at the top all the time, then we definitely want to look at turning that up. So persistent property queue rate, this is a really interesting one that uh, that is actually only available on the uh, metrics endpoint. It's not really, uh, presently there's no way to see this directly in ThingWorks, but uh, it's a big one. Uh, you might have seen another video that I did on um, on what persistent, persistent properties do if we have them um, overused uh, and, and essentially it's quite common for people to to think that they should persist per, uh, telemetry properties but it's essentially something you should never do so I've purposely activated this on a couple of entities where I have some some persisted properties that are coming in uh, from those MQTT lines um, so there's nine persisted properties there that's actually it. There's nine persisted properties that are coming in at the 250 millisecond intervals. That's uh, equating to 2,100 uh, persisted property per second, right? So the good thing is, is just because of how the subsystems and ThingWorks are designed, is this persisted property subsystem is taking that 2,100,000 ,000 and it's packaging those up into optimized writes. So we have the, the total number at the top, and here you can see the total batches written. So it is taking them and batching them up into 150, 140 uh, particular batches that are going to then go and hit the, the database table. Uh, but that is still, you know, 150 updates to the particular property VTQ table per second. And um, 
something that should be avoided. So moving down, um, this is pretty boring, right? The ThingWorks persistence provider for streams, and that's because I'm not using it. I'm using the InfluxDB one, but uh, it's the same for both. Uh, for the native, um, whichever the model provider you're using here, if you are using the data on the model provider, uh, the default persistence provider, and same for value streams. We do have a couple of things that are being stored here on the value on the, but mostly, mostly we've got things coming in uh, to InfluxDB here. So, you know, you can see the the stream queue rate. This is tied to the, um, this is tied to those um, simulated sensors and gateways that I that I have coming in here, and and they're essentially creating stream entries uh, based on those values coming in off the the sensors. So I think there's. 12, 1600 um, sensor values coming in per second that are creating these stream entries, uh, and we've got them queuing up here and essentially being written out to to influx. Um, and we'll probably have a better representation if we look at this over the past three or four hours, just because, um, yeah, you can see some of the periods where I've ramped the things up a little bit, uh, as well as, look, some comments and annotations that I've put on there about uh, bringing those those four gateways, each with 100 sensors online. I uh, brought another four gateways online, and then um, I can't recall if it was here. It might have been here. This is where I essentially uh, halved this end interval. So I took it from one second down to 500 milliseconds just to really double our traffic get more values coming in as well as um, uh, putting more pressure on the uh, influx DB as well as ThingWorks. And, um, you know, I here I've added some things. These are just the configurations, right? These are configurations that are coming off of ThingWorks as a way for, for me or looking, you know, taking a snapshot. The only reason I put them in here is to take a snapshot of what's happening over time this does have a little bit of a, a graph here, so we can see if we're needing more and more threads over a particular period to handle more load. Um, but it's mostly just to say if I took a snapshot uh, screen, screen capture of this, you'd see the number of threads that are behind servicing these particular uh, stream setup right here, as well as, as well as some overall statistical metrics here in the legend on the the average um, average min and max to kind of give us a bit of a picture in a real world scenario it's not going to be this this flat so just to kind of give us a picture of um, some of the peaks and troughs if we were looking at this over over a longer period like uh, like a day or a week or a month um yeah, and then these ones on the bottom here, these uh, didn't put any labels on them. I think if you put your mouse over this little eye, it says what it is. But this is just thread status and errors. I wanted to take the errors out. So the queue speed is on the top, and this one is on the on the bottom are just um, you know successes and failures, essentially. Uh, this way, by putting them on another trend, we're not going to have you know 10,000 messages like we see this peak up to 10,000. If we have one or two errors that come up here, they would be essentially invisible on this when we had 10,000 up here. So I've just put them on a separate um, axis down here and a separate trend that's going to show us, you know, the successes and failures. Um, here, this is the batches that are written as well as the batches that have failed, and uh, the current current threads that are active. So. Uh, this is similar to this, right? But it's over time. So if I were to go back and look maybe at some load tests that I did a couple of days ago, I can come back in here and, and you know, still be able to see how many threads were present at that particular test. So, I mean, there's some other things in here. Um, you know, data table processing is, is also in here. I'm not using any data tables in here. You obviously need to be very careful with the use of... Um, uh, data tables, uh, especially when you uh, have a large amount of queries, and and you know you shouldn't be using it for the telemetry type uh, use cases, which is why I don't have anything here because I'm doing telemetry ingest, and um, some of the other systems I'm not going to go over, but I've just kind of got them collapsed. That I've not built them out as much as I have on some of the other ones, but I did try to build the alert mechanism as well. So here we're probably going to have to go back much further. 
uh, to sort of see some some alerts. There should be some in here. Alerts queued. Yeah, right. So uh, when was this? So this was in November. Um, I have uh, up the uh, retention to one year, and and frankly, I think it's quite nice to be able to, you know, just be able to go back and forth across all these different systems over time, to be able to say, oh yeah, you know, that time we we had that particular issue, or we did those particular tests. What were the results? You know, what was going on? And here you can see that I'm able to come back and look look back across November of last year. And see this some testing that I did with the alert uh, alert queues and um, alert subsystem, and uh, it's kind of all available together. So that's it for the uh, the ThingWorks Foundation dashboard. I'm conscious that this is getting to be quite a long um, video, but as I mentioned, this is a pretty um, hefty topic, and um, I really felt. That it's important that we do it justice. Um, the Shang's community post has been quite inspirational for me, but um, you know there is really a lot of uh, things to monitor in uh, these overall aspects. So it's important to have a look at those. So that was the application in ThingWorks. You know we do have other components, right? I mentioned the graphite metrics coming from coming from uh, the connection server, or in our case here the Azure IoT Hub connector. And you can see similar view to what we saw in the JVM metrics earlier, but these are coming off of that graphite endpoint. And um, frankly, some cool things. I've, I've just added processor and memory so we can get at the top just to get a, a quick snapshot view of what the memory performance is looking like. Um, and um, I haven't added the direct methods yet in the, the twin um, service executions for the overall Azure IoT, those those metrics are obviously available from the uh, the graphite uh, metrics, and here we've got that those thread statuses again, very important for just monitoring overall thread states. You know this can be a really helpful troubleshooting tool. You know without getting into looking at logs and things like that over time, we can come in here and see how busy the connector is. And then um, you know some ingress parameters that are coming on one side from the IoT Hub, on the other side going into ThingWorks. Uh, I've also thrown in the the message size. You know these are some statistics that are in there just to kind of have a bit of a, a baseline. And you can see that there's four lines in here. The reason for that is they're per partition. So by default, the IoT Hub we've got four partitions, and so uh, you know I can be pretty sure that these are those three devices that are all on partition three. And um, and then I've added some aspects of egress. Um, I mean, normally we should, I was gonna say, I thought we uh, set this up, but let's see if it's still working. Yeah, so this might have stopped responding let's try to run this again so I do have this simulator device that I've just added okay so here you can see we're receiving some messages uh, and basically I have a kind of a ping pong set up so that as there's a message that comes in from this simulator device it's coming in ThingWorks and ThingWorks is sending back a message a cloud to device message just by writing on this property um, Kitsim, see here there's, there's this um, CDD timer that's triggering periodic message sends and um, and that's just done by um, message response. It's just writing a value to this message response which is going to go back then down to, um, to the IoT hub device and um, you know we should be able to see that in here last one hour. Um, uh, yeah, there's, so there's the property rights that are that are coming up there, and um, so that's really the connector side. The application is running on the connector side, but we do have some other interesting and relevant metrics. You know, we're talking about Azure metrics and uh, Azure Log Analytics. Some of the things that we have in the application that's running to connect ThingWorks to Azure are quite specific to the overall uh, traffic. 
But there's also some other interesting things that we need to be conscious of, like overall daily quotas. So here, here I've built a dashboard that's using um, that's using uh, where's my data source? Edward settings. Yeah, so the data source here for these this whole dashboard is not Prometheus, but it's instead it's um, you can see here it's Azure Monitor. So I have um, a connection over here to my Azure Monitor subscription and the resource group over where I have my IoT hub, where I'm I'm connected to uh, using a service principal account um, here. And here we can really start to get some of the metrics that Azure metrics have. So you can see the direct method invocations. Uh, and there's eight failed invocations that are showing up, uh, as well as request side. So I think uh, this is likely due to the uh, the fact that my OPC UA uh, server doesn't seem to be working properly. So this is probably what these failed invocations are. And uh, we've got some other things here, like the deliveries completed 731. This is probably, yeah, this is exactly it. That uh, simulator that I was just showing you where we're sending messages back, cloud to device messages back. This is where those 60 deliveries uh, completed and for some reason it stopped. So I restarted the simulator and you can see here that, uh, that uh, some of them are completed. Some of them are being rejected as well, potentially because of throttling limits. Um, as I think we're getting to the uh, the the top end of uh, the S1 IoT hub that I have currently configured, but anyways, this is an interesting segue to, you know, the other reason we want to set this stuff up is to to know what's going on quickly, right? Because, you know, there is a question of a ThingWorks application and how it's running and overall health, but we are talking about distributed systems and distributed solutions. Here we're talking about IoT hub communications, and if there is something that's going on. You know, having this sort of um, dashboard is quite important to be able to see on a trend here, something like this, quickly that you've got, uh, you know, failed direct method invocations that are showing up, right? Or, or all types of errors that we can look at over, over time. I'm going to go back a little bit farther, six hours, and let's see, right? So here we can see the different, different errors that are coming up over time. So those are constant. And we don't have any throttling errors, and this is kind of a neat stuff. This is not obviously um, metrics we're, we're looking at down here, right? I mentioned um, Azure Log Analytics, but because I've wired the IoT Hub up to my Log Analytics workbook, uh, here I can use um, the Grafana Azure integration for the data source in Azure to also do uh, Log Analytics queries. So I've just essentially taken a default um, default uh, custo QL query to get errors off of the um, uh, related to IoT Hub. And I've uh, sliced it and diced it in three different ways that you can see here. It's the same query. Uh, one is just giving me kind of a, a quick top-down overview of, you know, what's the category of errors? What's the result, 40304? device maximum queue depth exceeded how many of them there are you know giving me a particular view this is the specific errors which allowed me to quickly find that this was related to the dev kit sim dev kit sim 2 3 before and um you know this is just kind of a, a trend view so that i can quickly have those those potential errors that are causing me communications challenges uh come to come to my attention so let me just shut that off Okay, so moving on, we haven't talked about databases at all. Um, I'd say the databases are the next thing. Azure SQL, I did have some challenges getting data out of Azure SQL. Uh, and that's really just, I'm trying to think why, that's really just because of where I have it hosted. Um, the service principle that I use to get the data off of the IoT Hub I'll, is because I'm in a different tenant and uh, here the Azure SQL is hosted in a place that I can't make a service principle so I had to take a different technique and here I used a uh, Azure metrics exporter for Prometheus so there I used managed identities uh, to configure on the VM 
and the managed identity is what's giving me access to the Azure SQL to get those metrics and then essentially exposing them to Prometheus. So it's a, a bit of a different approach, but I think it's a good example of one of those things is there's lots of ways to get metrics. Um, you're always going to find different metrics in different formats. You know, we've been talking about many so far here, and this is just kind of another one of those examples. I'm just trying to get things as standardized as possible and kind of into a singular pane of glass. So we can see here over the past um, few hours, you know, I've got a 20 DTU Azure SQL here. It's, it's really under no stress at all. Um, I maybe should have kept it smaller, but for the purpose of this kind of load test and demonstration, the idea was not to put SQL under duress, but, um, but really just kind of go through the, the notions of monitoring and looking at some of the different things. You know, one of the things that's interesting is here, in here is we can see the, the, the moment in time when the connections are occurring. So if I go back a little bit further, I uh, should be able to see when ThingWorks restarts over here. And, um, you know, we can see number of connections and workers that are running when there's, you know, larger utilization. And um, you can also see deadlocks. We don't have any deadlocks here, but, you know, same if we go back over the one year, we might see some uh, deadlocks. I think the deadlock testing that I did was actually before I, I set the history back. But, you know, you can also see this is similar to what I was mentioning before. You can see that the DTU utilization is changing. So here I've done some scaling, uh, scaling up and scaling down. And we can see how the uh, utilization is fitting within the, um, the configured uh, limits. And then coming over to Influx, um, in a sense, it's the most interesting. But in another sense, it's really the least interesting because um, uh, frankly, I mean, this is probably the smallest VM that you can get on, on Azure, and it's just taking it like a champ. We already looked at how much those those uh, messages have been optimized because of the, the way that the value uh, and value stream and stream processing subsystems are batching things together. So they're also, you know, even if we have 10,000 writes, they're batching things together so that it actually equates to um, number of requests here you can see is is quite small. Uh, operations per second, 50 operations per second is really not that that large on the influx side of things. And um, you know what is interesting to hear is to to kind of keep an eye on the query operations, make sure your queries are running smoothly. Everything that we're doing, I'm not doing any queries really. I mean, in this load testing, I'm not querying, I'm not hitting the database with large queries. But you know, you can use this to have um, a view on how you, how your influx queries are handling query time as as well as result size. You know, uh, having a look at how large are the result sets that you're getting back going because that's obviously going to be very important on. You know, how much data processing does ThingWorks have to do on the results that are coming back from Influx? Same with HTTP errors. I have seen, I uh, can't recall where it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, time series uh, compaction, full compaction was going on, and, and, and Influx was, was essentially had been shut down because of the fact that it was doing maintenance due to large volumes of updates. And so basically influx DB itself was refusing the connections, despite the fact that we could have had more connections. It was saying, look, I'm unable to process the requests that you, you're giving me. So uh, we did see a number of, um, you know, client, uh, client errors that's uh, relevant over here. And, uh, you know, here you can see what's our last one hour, you know, maintenance activities, right? Compaction status compaction duration, compaction errors, level one, level two, level three, cache. You shouldn't, you shouldn't see full compactions happening very frequently. It should be a very rare event. These compactions should be happening quickly. And, um, you know, if we look kind of over the last period of time, you see that, you know, there's these small compaction events that, 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 that do pop up. And this is, you know, normal. This is how InfluxDB works. What we don't want is them to be running all the time because there is a significant amount of overhead. It means they're working on uh, uh, the shards that InfluxDB uses, and um, and it's going to limit the um, the capabilities and the performance of Influx. Same, we got some garbage collection and some memory stats down here, but all is good. So there you have it. 
consider that an update on ThingWorks monitoring with Grafana and Prometheus, as well as Azure Metrics. And uh, stay tuned for the upcoming videos on how to configure this and use some of these aspects yourself.